I want to read um, from Job to start with, Job chapter 1, if you don't mind. Uh, Job chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. It says, and I'm reading from the NIV, In the land of us there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters, and he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys, and had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. And then Job chapter 3, which takes place after Job has gone through his period of suffering, Chapter 3 is when Job begins to speak to his comforters. Verse 1, after this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. He said, may the day of my birth perish, and the night that said a boy is conceived. That day may it turn to darkness. May God above not care about it. May no light shine on it. May gloom and utter darkness claim it once more. May a cloud settle over it. May blackness overwhelm it. And then on to verse 26, which is the last verse in the chapter. Job says, I have no peace, no quietness. I have no rest, but only turmoil. Now, there are some difficult faith questions that as Christians we, we have to face. Um, questions like, where is God when it hurts? Um, some not, might know that. There's a name of a Philip Yancey book. Why does God allow suffering? That's caused people to actually lose their faith um, and to... Just go away from the Lord altogether. And it's a really difficult and a sad question. Why does God, or why did God allow a virus to spread around the world and kill millions? Last time I looked in the official figures, there are over 5 million. But I think it's nearer 15 million have died because of COVID. Why does God allow that? And the current one is why doesn't God stop the war in Ukraine? These are the difficult questions that sometimes we have to face and try and come up with answers for if it is at all possible to have an answer. We know full well from scripture that God has told us that his ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. So in reality, we're not going to understand these things, but that doesn't seem to satisfy us at times and we can end up disillusioned distraught, doubting, and rejecting our faith. Now, I've got two of these questions, or types of questions I, I want to address today, uh, dependent on time. The first question is, is God unfair? And the second question, if I have time, is, does God care when we suffer? Now, I think they've got great significance for us today which is why I'm asking, and which is why um, Job, the book of Job, is relevant for us today. It's a very difficult book, but it contains help for us in this concept of unfairness, and I'll come to that soon. Now, if you've ever read Under Milkwood by Dylan Thomas, um, you've probably wasted a lot of time if you have, because it's not an easy book to read at all. And I say that as a, as a proud Welshman. Um, he gives unusual names to some of his characters in that book. Uh, he's got one called Sinbad Sailors. And then he's got uh, No Good Boyo. Who I've, it's a strange name totally, but Boyo is something we call people in South Wales. And best of all, he's got Mrs. Die Bread too. Uh, and I said to my wife, well, do you know who that is? And she did straight away because she's a wrong to girl. You may not know, um, but Mrs. Die Bread too is Die Bread's second wife. No idea what happened to the first wife. And Die Bread was the baker. 
And it, they got this idea in, about Wales that we call people by, by names like die bread the baker, um, die the bread, uh, sorry, die the post, the postman. I, I must admit, I've never heard of anyone named that, but I do know for real uh, a man who was called Die Doom and Gloom. Uh, that's what his nickname was in work. And I'll tell you his story just to emphasize this idea of unfairness. Now, Di is from North Wales. He's from Gwynedd. He grew up surrounded by the mountains near Bala Lake, a beautiful part of the country, the son of a Methodist minister. Uh, and he left home to go to college, trained to be a teacher, and eventually became the head of a, a department, a history department. He married a teacher. Um, she was um, probably even better than him at his job or more ambitious. And she went further up the ladder than he did. So between them, they had good earnings and they were comfortable. And they had a daughter who they both doted on. And then Di came to know the Lord. Now, I'm never sure whether he came to know the Lord or whether his faith was revived. He was a, a Methodist minister, son, after all. So maybe it's revived, but I think he came to know the Lord as an adult. And you think to yourself, life can't get any better. He's grown up in a wonderful part of the world. He's got a wife. He's got a child. They're earning well. He now knows the Lord. This is great. His wife didn't want to be married to a Christian. She left him. And she took the child with him. And to this day, as far as I'm aware, the daughter won't have anything to do with her dad. She's completely cut him off, as has the wife. He struggled as a result. His health suffered. He had a breakdown. He had to give up the teaching profession. And you ask yourself, or you think to yourself, that seems so unfair. Here's a man who's come to the Lord. He should know blessing in his life as a result. But everything falls apart. Well, that's really the essence of the book of Job to me. Um, I can't go through the whole book, can I? There's 42 chapters. So, so I'll be very grateful for that. Um, and it's a very difficult book anyway. There are two things that we need to bear in mind when we even consider Job. One is to read it the way they tell me you eat an elephant, which is in small chunks. Never tried eating an elephant, um, but they say in small chunks. That's the way to read Job, because you won't get through it otherwise. And the other way is to understand that a lot of Job is poetry. And if um, Dylan Thomas is hard, so is a lot of poetry. And it's important when you look at Job to say to yourself, I'm probably not going to understand everything I'm reading. But you can bring out the major point, certainly, if you chunk it and read a bit of a time. Now, I'm assuming you know the general story. You've got this good man, the greatest in the East, he's called. On one day, he loses his livelihood. His oxen, sheep, oxen, camels, everything's gone. Most of his servants, and worst of all, his 10 children. And it's enough to make a man curse God, but not Job. This was a man of strong faith. And he says, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. It's remarkable faith and an example of trusting in God during difficult times. On a separate day, his skin becomes diseased, which leaves him with painful boils all over his body. And I think out of compassion for him, his wife says, curse God and die. She just wanted to end his suffering. But he says, shall we accept good from God and not trouble? It's a remarkable word again, when you imagine the suffering that he's going through. If you read Job, those early chapters, you'll see him sitting in ashes, scraping himself to try and ease the pain. It's an awful thing, but he accepts it from God. 
he's visited by three friends who have come to comfort him, very genuine in their desire. And they sit for seven days saying nothing. Presumably they're shocked by Job's condition and don't know what to say. But in those seven days, they formulate opinions about what's happened to Job. And those opinions change the way they eventually speak to him. After seven days, Job speaks first and he reveals his true condition. In Job 3, verse 26, he says, I have no peace, no quietness. I have no rest, but only turmoil. Now, I don't think there's anyone in scripture who's, who has suffered more than Job, apart from the Lord Jesus. Terrible suffering, but he maintains his faith. But he's now describing a state of affairs for himself that I think many of us might understand and which makes Job relevant because what Job is describing there is a perfect state of affairs of someone who has a mental health problem that is severe. And I can speak from personal experience about that and so could others. It's a state of mind of somebody who's going through a real trial in their life of any sort. No peace, no quietness, no rest, just turmoil. So we can learn from Job about what's, what's happening. Why is God allowing these things to happen? Is he being unfair? Now, what's happened to Job, of course, is preceding by amazing scenes in heaven where angels present themselves to God People like Gabriel and Michael, I assume, and Satan also. And Satan thinks he's outwitting God, but he has no idea what God's plans are for Job. And this is all of God's plan for Job, even though it doesn't seem that way to Job himself, who's suffering a lot with the pain he's going through. And then we've got these comforters, and we all need comforters, don't we? We need people to come and put an arm around us and cry with us and offer consoling words. And those men had come to do that, but they changed completely. And their, their whole attitude, excuse me while I move this forward a bit on the screen, their whole attitude was different. And rather than being comforters, they made him suffer. It's um, Charles Swindle, who I'm indebted to, who gave me a better insight into these three comforters. He showed me that they, they've approached Job from different angles. They're all saying the same thing, ultimately, but they've approached it from a completely different viewpoint. Um, Eliphaz bases everything he says on experience. He talks about past experiences and he uses them to determine, well, this must be the case also with Job. He says in Job 4, verses 7 and 8, consider now who being innocent has ever perished. Where were the upright ever destroyed? As I observed, those who plough evil and those who reap it and those who sow trouble, uh, sorry, those who plough evil and those who sow trouble reap it. That's what they're saying about Job. This is the beginning of the assault on God's character. You're a bad man, Job. The reason you're suffering is because you're a bad man. You've got this reputation as being a good man but you must have done something to deserve this god doesn't punish the upright you must have done something wrong bildad comes in next and he's probably the worst of the three comforters bildad is really hard he's judgmental and he doesn't mix his words his very first comments to job included this when your children sinned against him, he gave them over to the penalty of their sin. Job's lost 10 children in one incident, seven sons, three daughters. He's grieved the loss of 10 children. And his friend, Bildad, says they deserved everything they got. They sinned against God and they deserved it. That's what Job had to put up with from Bildad. And then we've got Zophar, who is a bit of a problem because there are a lot of Zophars around today. He's got no really solid base for his views. He just says what comes into his head. 
and he's not basing anything on, on reality. He's not basing anything on scripture. And he speaks of why the prevailing wind is, I suppose. And that's dangerous. And we do have people like that in the Christian world today. And I'm not saying within the fellowship. I don't see it within the fellowship, honestly, personally, in my, the circles I walk in. But out there in the wider Christian world, there's a lot of things being said, a lot of harm being done to the name of the Lord by people who are just saying whatever comes into their head. We live in a post-Christian world and they've become affected by all sorts of things out there like new ageism and so on. It was going to happen. Paul, speaking to the Ephesian elders, said, I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. We need to watch what we read. We need to watch what we listen to. We need to watch what we believe. So far, I was just saying anything, really, just to make his points. And there was no sound as to, to what he said. Uh, one of the first things he said to Job in chapter 11 was, how I, how I wish that God would speak that he would open his lips against you. He wanted God to condemn Job. But God didn't, of course. Now, the point of all three men is that they're legalistic. And they've come to Job and have reached an agreement, whether before they came or while they sat watching him, that he's a sinner. And he's being punished because he's a sinner. In their minds, sin brings judgment. Sin brings punishment. Sin brings suffering. And that's what they see in Job, so they assume he's a sinner. And they cannot get that idea out of their heads. Job had a different idea. And I'm aware the time is going, so I'll need to move quicker. Job's idea was that God was being unfair to him. Job was rightly insistent through all these conversations, and he never wavers throughout the book of Job, that he did not sin. He had not sinned against God. And we certainly know from the, from the two days when these awful things happened to him, we're told that he didn't sin. He was not a sinner. So he thought God was doing something to him that was unfair. And he thinks, Why? And he wanted to contend with God. He wanted an audience with God. He wanted God to speak to him so he could have this sorted out. So you've got five men, because there's another one afterwards called Elihu, a young man who comes in. And not one of them is speaking properly about what has happened to Job. They've all got it wrong. Four of them badly wrong. But Job just is misunderstanding because he wasn't party to what happened in heaven. He knows nothing about that and what God is doing. God eventually spoke to Job. And this is the part of Job that I tend to enjoy reading. I've got to be honest with Job. I read the beginning, skip an awful lot and go to the end. I get to verse chapter 38 and we just love to read chapter 38. And we see this amazing God that we have. He talks about the Pleiades and the Orion and the Bear, the Behemoth and the Leviathan. This is a God of awesome creative power who overwhelms us. And Job, who's been saying, why me, is silent before God. He raised, who am I to speak to God the way he does? What's um, amazing about this passage is that within it, this great passage of creative power, there's a verse which I've missed, um, often missed it, but I only saw it recently as I was preparing for this. It's Job 40, verse 8. I always thought Job doesn't really get an answer, but I think this is an answer. God says to Job, would you discredit my justice 
And it's this bit, would you condemn me to justify yourself? That's what Job's been doing without realizing. In insisting upon his innocence, in demanding an, uh, an audience before God, the right to put his case, he's trying to justify himself. I know I'm not a sinner, I don't deserve this. This isn't, this isn't fair. But in doing that, the only place that leads is that, yeah, God is being unfair. If Job is right, then yes, God is being unfair. But of course, we know God is never unfair. God can never be unfair. And Job says, when he realizes this, surely I spoke of things I did not understand. And that's something a lot of people do. We speak of things we don't understand. And we get ourselves into difficult places. And it does lead to some people losing their faith. We have to understand that God works in ways that are beyond our understanding. He allows things to happen that on the surface may seem unfair to us, but they're not. They're good things. Ultimately, they're for our good. But even more than that, they're for the Lord's good as well. You remember the story in John about the man born blind and the disciples asking him, well, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? It's just an assumption. Sin has got to be involved with something being bad. It was still there all these years later. And Lord said, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. That's also what's happening to Job. The works of God are being displayed in him in a most remarkable way that uh, Job certainly wasn't appreciating at the time. No one else was. We can today because we have the full book of Job. We can see where it took Job and the blessings he received later. There's another scripture about the death of Lazarus. Um, where the Lord said about the death of Lazarus, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. God allows things for his glory, and we're not going to understand those things. We're not going to appreciate them as they happen to us. We're going to be caught in the middle of it, and it's going to... It's going to upset us. It's going to make us distraught. It could destroy us unless we understand that God has purpose in this and we must trust him through it. You remember the storm with the Lord Jesus in the boat with his disciples. He was sleeping and they were overwhelmed. They thought they were going to die. These experienced fishermen thought they were going to die. So they woke the Lord up and said, don't you care if we drown? That's, that's a shocking thing to say to the Lord. Don't you care to the God who loves us, to the God who is going to Calvary to die for them? Don't you care? He didn't wake up. He slept in the storm because he knew everything was fine. But he calmed the storm for them. Peace be still. And the calm, the storm subsided straight away and they find themselves at the shore. We like that. We sing, Master, the tempest is raging. We love peace, be still. But the Lord chided them for their lack of faith. They were meant to go through that storm, you know. I'm convinced of that. I'm convinced they were meant to suffer it and come through the other end of it, trusting in the Lord. If he was asleep in the boat with them, they were okay. They didn't need to wake him up. They didn't need to cry out for his help. They didn't need to say, don't you care? They were safe. And he took them safely to the other side. And you and I will go through bad times in our lives. Each of us will do it at some point. And it will be many times, I think. And we'll want to cry out to God, please take this storm away. Please calm it. Please bring peace. Well, have you ever thought that maybe you're meant to pass through the storm? Maybe by passing through the storm, 
you bring glory to God and let him show his, his awesome wonders in your life. Of course, it's hard and painful and distressing, but the best thing might be to pass through the storm. Job certainly had to pass through his storm, and God blessed him as a result of it. He came to know his God better. He came to understand him better, to value him more. And that's something that can happen to you and I if we just learn to trust God through the difficult times and through the storms. Mm -hmm.